you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn to the New Testament book of Romans, chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. As Ashley mentioned, we are starting a new series today, and we're talking about us. This is us is the name of the series. And I want you to become very familiar with a phrase that we're going to repeat throughout this series. The phrase is this, people like us do things like this. Can you repeat that? with me. People like us do things like this. And we're going to talk about people like us throughout this series and the things that we do that define us as the body of Christ, but also as the Brook Church. And I want to say clearly, unapologetically, that we're talking about the things that we should do with respect to one another and how we treat one another. And people like us are going to do things like this. We're going to do that as we look to each other and respect one another and treat one another. And today I want to talk to you about extending grace in the messy middle. Extending grace in the messy middle. Next week we're going to talk about communication. Ephesians 4 has got so many great passages. The whole chapter really is about maturity in Christ and unity in Christ and many lessons about communication. The week after that we're going to talk about, well, what happens when relationships break? And what is the Bible's instruction with respect to restoring relationships and reconciling relationships? And then the final week, we're going to talk about the role of church leadership with respect to providing peace and community and access and function and order in the body of Christ. And I think that's going to be instructive to many of you. So today, as we're talking about this, I want to make sure that that statement really resonates. This is us. People like us do things like this. This has to do with who we are. Uh, People like us act like this toward one another. And if we're going to be real people finding real hope in the real world, which is our vision statement, if we're going to enjoy life-giving relationships with others, if we're going to fulfill our potential even in Christ, then we must assimilate the actions and attitudes that the Bible talks about with respect to one another. How we treat one another is vital to our spiritual growth. And so some of these things are skills to put into practice. And the good, things about, the good thing about skills is that if you commit yourself, if you have effort and you have prayer, you can learn new skills. But many of these things have to do with character. And while skills are learned, character is often developed. And often through a painful process. These things relate to character. And so I'm going to talk to us about the character that we have and how that gets expressed in our attitude and actions. And I'm going to challenge each and every one of us to act like grown-ups. To grow up as we relate to one another. So let's look at what the Apostle Paul says about this whole idea of extending grace in the messy middle. Because he has some Pretty stern words to the church in Rome. Here it is, Romans chapter 14. And I put up here that I'm reading from the NIV version, 1984 interpretation, translation of the Bible, because as I did my word study this week, I felt like this translation in particular, as compared to what we usually use, had the kind of wording that was more consistent with the original language. And I wanted to use that for us today. Here's what it says Accept him whose faith is. Weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. Now, he's not talking about being a vegan. We're going to come back to that in just a moment, okay? Because this might, well, what is going on? What's he talking about here? We'll come back to that in just a second. Verse 3 The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. Do you see the back and forth here? Paul's talking about relating to one another in matters of eating food, certain types of food, for God has accepted him. Who are you? The Apostle Paul says, who do you think you are to judge someone else's servant? In other words, that person is the servant of God, not yours. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. And Paul goes on and on and on. We're going to look at some of these passages. Really, the whole chapter is a great, great text for us to understand how to relate to each other in the messy middle. Now, what does that mean? In this context, in the first century, the Apostle Paul is talking to a church that has just uh, experienced amazing kinds of things 
in relationship to one another. So the church in Rome was a large church, and it was a diverse church. You can imagine the multicultural aspect of the city of Rome. And so what you had is you had in this church, you had people who from a Jewish background who now came to faith in Christ, and they were in this church. You had people who were from a Greek background, a secular, more secular background, who now were thrown into this church as believers. And they're learning how to relate to one another. And they all come with their own certain baggage and certain uh, preferences and certain opinions. And so when I talk about the messy middle, here, here's what I'm describing. I'm talking about those things that Paul says are disputable matters. Other uh, translations will call them interpretable matters. Other translations will call them opinions. He says, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on the opinions of others, on the disputable matters. So the messy middle to me is all about this. I have me on one side and everybody else on the other side. And what's here in the middle? What's in the messy middle? Our differences. And those differences include preferences that I might have about certain things. They include opinions that I might have about certain things. But they also include personal convictions that I might have about certain things. Now, here's the important thing to recognize. That the messy middle is not about essentials. It's not about the fundamentals of faith. It's about interpretable matters, disputable matters. It's about opinions. Here's what those disputable matters are. And by the way, me and others turn into us versus them. And when you begin to view other people in the body of Christ, that they stand opposite of me, that we're not in the same family together, or us versus them, then you begin to have these problems. So here are what the disputable matters are. First of all, they do not concern Christian salvation. Paul is not talking about differences of opinion about what salvation is. That's not what he's talking about. They do not concern moral, ethical, or doctrinal essentials. Of course there are things that are moral or immoral. Of course there are things that are ethical or unethical. Of course there are things that are theologically sound and theologically off. He's not talking about those things. He's talking about disputable things, differences that people have about opinions and preferences and even personal convictions that they might hold to. Believing this, that there are some things that you might believe that are interpretable from the Scripture. Things that you have deduced that you believe God wants you to do that other people may not hold to. And Paul says, don't judge your brother and sister because of those. That there are people who will love God just as much as you and yet see things differently in these things matters. Here's the other thing. They are, however, matters of individual preference or conviction. Now, you think about this. What's going on here in the first century? Well, to the Jews, there were two big kinds of things that were really important to them. Dietary laws and then special Jewish holidays. This was really important to them. This was their tradition, and so they brought this into the church there in Rome. For the Greeks, it was pagan celebrations and other certain foods that they felt free to eat. They had differences of opinion about that. So the Apostle Paul, he's outlining special religious holidays. He's talking about certain diets, what to eat, what not to eat. And Paul is saying, don't pass judgment on one another because these are disputable matters. They are not essentials to the faith. So today, what would be disputable matters? Well, I have differences of opinion about music. What is acceptable to listen to and what is not? Listen, again, I'm talking about not crossing the threshold of morality. Of course there's immoral music. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just differences from the standpoint of what music we might listen to. Movies. Of course there are immoral movies. Nobody should watch immoral movies. But within that box, the messy middle, we have differences of opinion about what is acceptable, what is not. Certain things to eat, certain things not to eat. I know there are Christians who disagree about whether Halloween should be celebrated by families, right? That it's satanic to go out and have your kids trick-or-treat. We've gone trick-or-treating our whole lives with our kids. We enjoy it. We don't dress up like demons and we don't go crazy. But we enjoy the whole, the whole holiday. We love it. It's fun. It's a chance to meet our neighbors. Christians have differences of opinion about that. Differences of opinion about Santa. 
Yes, differences of opinion about that. Differences of opinion about drinking alcohol. Differences of opinion in theological matters, doctrinal matters. Differences about end times, about predestination or free will, about spiritual gifts, about gifts of tongue, gifts of prophecy, all these kinds of things. Dispensationalism, Calvinism, all these kinds of things. All these things that Christians will fight about that the Apostle Paul would say are not worthy of fighting about. Those are disputable matters. All kinds of things that Christians can argue about. And Paul is giving instructions here about how to handle them as grown-ups in the body of Christ. These disputable matters have to do with the problem of the petty, the picky, and of projections. This is probably the biggest thing. That I have a preference, I have an opinion, I have a personal conviction, and I project that upon somebody else saying that they should feel about it the same way that I feel about it. Paul would say that's immaturity. That's not leaving room for diversity. That's not leaving room for people to see things differently from you. Let me give you an example of this. Let's say that I'm a person in the church that really likes to help the church. I mean, I like to roll up my sleeves and help the church, and I have a passion for landscaping. I'm just picking something out of the, out of the blue here. Landscaping, and so on a Saturday morning, I care so deeply about it. I want the, the bushes and the shrubs and the flowers to look really good at the church. So Saturday mornings, I'm up early. You know, as the sun is coming up, and I'm out there, and I'm pulling weeds out of the flower bed. And I'm trimming the shrubs, and you know, I'm making this look good. I get all excited and passionate about it, right? And then at about 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning, I see people walking into the church for a prayer meeting. And I say to myself, if those people loved God like I do, they'd be here with me. If they love my church like I do, they'd be here. What am I doing? I'm projecting onto other people the thing that I am passionate about, expecting them to have the same passion, the same conviction, and really the same results. That's immaturity. Paul is going to admonish us to own our own convictions, but not to project them onto other people. So let's look at these instructions. He says there, look in verse 3 again, the man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. He's talking about those. The man who eats everything is obviously the Greek who feels the freedom to eat whatever, food that have been sacrificed to idols, the meat from strangled animals. Those are things that the Jews should not do, but the Greek feels freedom to do that. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything, the one who is limited in what he chooses to do and feels personal conviction about what to eat, he must not condemn or judge the man who does. So two sides of this coin. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the one liberated. And he's saying to the one that's liberated, the one who feels permission and freedom, don't condescend toward those who don't feel the same freedom as you do. Don't look down on them. And to the ones who are limited, he's saying don't condemn. Both of these are passing judgment on the brother and sister in Christ. Now, as we're thinking about this, Paul is going to give some admonition and some instruction for every one of us. He's talking to all now at this point, the ones liberated, the ones who are limited, the ones who choose to hold to personal convictions and limit their freedom, and that's okay, but also the ones who feel freedom and permission in Christ. Here's what he says to everyone, all of us in this room. The first thing he says is stop judging others. Verse 13. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Stop judging others. Stop judging others. <laughs> judging others is rooted in personal insecurity. It's rooted in self-righteousness. In other words, judgmentalism is all, all about the way I define myself in comparison to others. The only way I can define myself by being good is to make other people bad. And so I judge them in order to puff myself up and to pride myself up in this sense. 
Now, there's a difference between judging others and having discernment. Of course, we're to have discernment, and we are to make judgments. But that's different than judging the heart of another individual. And I can say in my heart, I don't think I'll do what they're doing, and yet not judge their motivations. This is where we get into trouble. We're judging the hearts of others. Jesus said in Matthew 7, you may remember this. Jesus said, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye, but not the log in your own eye? A lot of theologians believe that this was Jesus' attempt at humor, by the way. He, he's using hyperbole, and by the way, if Jesus tells a joke, you've got to laugh at it, right? So is, is this, imagine this, this guy has a little speck, right? He's looking at the speck in his brother's eye. He's got these tweezers. He's trying to take the speck out of his brother's eye, but he's got this big log in his own. The ideal here is you're, you're nitpicking the small thing about your brother while you've got this big thing going on with yourself. What is Jesus teaching here? He's saying that we possess the tendency to be far more critical of others than we are of ourselves. We're judges of other people, but we're attorneys of ourselves. Mother Teresa said, if you judge people, you have no time to love them. And you're preoccupied with the negative that you see. And by the way, there are people that are just preoccupied with that. Their lives tend to revolve around it. When you're preoccupied with that, you don't, you don't have the grace to see the story or the background that might be in another person. You don't have the room to see the pain that they may be experiencing because you don't know their story. I don't know their story. You don't know what's going on. You haven't walked in their shoes. You don't know why they might behave as they do. You don't know what their motivations are behind those things, and yet we're judging the intentions of others. Judging someone says very little about the person that's being judged, but it says a whole lot about the one who's judging. A whole lot about the one who's judging. There's this poisonous cycle, this downward spiral of judgmentalism. And it begins first with comparing. I compare, (laughs) and then I compete, and then I condemn. I compare myself to other people, and then as I'm comparing, I begin to set myself against them. I'm better. I'm doing this. And so I compete, and then ultimately I condemn. It's all rooted, mostly it is rooted in ignorance. The bedfellow of judgmentalism is ignorance. Take the time to get to know the people you judge. And it might change your mind. Stop judging others. Next, hold to your own convictions. Listen, the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, if you have personal convictions and preferences, then hold to them. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with them. Look at what he says. And one who is in the Lord, as one who is in the Lord Jesus, I'm fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. Now, Paul's a former Jew, a former Jewish leader, a Pharisee. And he's been set free by Christ. And he's saying, listen, I just believe that all food is okay to eat in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. And so he's encouraging these believers to stay true to their own conscience. If this is a personal conviction, if you have this as your own preference or opinion, then hold to it. Have integrity with it. But you can hold to your own opinion without judging others who don't hold to it. It's acting like a grown-up. That's how we relate to one another. Next, don't major on the minors. Look in verses 15 through 18. This first part is so convicting. Look at what he says. Do not by your eating destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. And by the way, so Paul again is doing a great job of talking about both sides of this coin because in one sense he's saying, listen, don't judge others. They're going to hold to something different than you hold to, but also don't let them judge you. Don't let what you hold to be okay to be spoken of as evil. Hold to it. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. He's saying the kingdom of God is much greater than these things so many people fight about. So it's all about categorizing and understanding the difference between what is important and what is not all that important. What are the essentials that are important to hold to and what are the non-essentials? I read a story a few years ago about a church that actually had a two-hour business meeting. 
that almost divided the church about what kind of chairs to buy for their fellowship hall. They brought in diagrams. They brought in a chiropractor <laughs> to talk about, and these people were pitied. This is what churches do. And in, in the meantime, people's souls are being lost. In the meantime, the whole message is getting watered down. Paul's saying, don't major on the minors. Keep what is most important, the most important. Next, he says, make peace a priority. Look down at verses 19 and 20. Let us, therefore, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. That's the most important. And then here's this convicting phrase. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of your own personal conviction and opinion. Make peace a priority. Desire it. Pursue it. Sadly, there are some who don't really desire peace. They want to be right. They feed off of conflict. They define themselves by that. Peace to them is you agreeing with them. That's not peace. Peace is where the relationship is a priority and our relationship is a priority. And the peace that we have between ourselves rises to the top. Next, he says, focus on yourself, not others. Look at what he says, verse 22. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Shut your mouth about what is not essential. Why are you judging others? Why do you think everybody has to believe the same thing about it that you do? Just keep it between yourself and God. He's talking about this whole idea of that we have an audience of one. He is the one to whom we're accountable. We're a servant to that master. So you do what you should do. And don't worry about what other people are doing or not doing. And you'll be a much happier person because of it. Next, whatever you practice, do so in faith. Don't practice it because of customs or tradition. Don't practice it because you're in rebellion to other people. Don't practice it because you're pleasing other people. Don't practice it because you want to portray some image. Whatever you believe, whatever personal convictions you have about all these matters that I listed, make sure that they come from faith. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. Isn't that interesting? Paul said, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And so, we should have the freedom to practice our faith in these disputable matters as God leads us, as the Holy Spirit directs us. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. So, what should be done should not be for show. It should be because God has placed it on my heart. It should not be because other people are doing it. It should not be because other people are not doing it. It should be from faith with a good conscience that God has led me to this, and I'm free in doing it. And you can judge me if you want, but this act, this belief I have is coming from faith. So here's a simple rule that we have here at the Brook church. And if you've been through our membership class, you've heard this before. It's a rule of thumb that we try to live by that actually originated in one of the early church fathers, St. Augustine. Here's what it says. In essential beliefs, unity. In essential beliefs, unity. And we've outlined what our essential beliefs are at the Brook. They're on our website. They're in our membership documents. We talk about the things that are major, essential, fundamental, orthodox Christian faith. We hold to those, and we have to have unity around those as a church. We will fight about those. It's about who God is, what the Word of God is, who man is in relationship to God. Those are the fundamentals of Christian faith. Those are essentials, and we need to have unity around that because that unity helps us to have identity with one another. It forms our sense of who we are as a church, as a Christian church. So in essential beliefs, unity. In non-essential beliefs, diversity. Everything beyond the essential is non-essential. 
And so we're a church that embraces the diversity of the individuals. Whereas the Holy Spirit leads you in these interpretable matters, you are free to decide how God wants you to live. Listen, we're trying to create culture here, not cult. Cult is where everybody has to think alike and look alike and talk alike. We want a diverse body. And you can have a difference of opinion about one of these interpretable matters and love God just as much as I do. And if we will relate to one another like that, we'll have a whole different kind of place here. And then in all of our beliefs, charity, that old King James word for love. Charity for and with one another. Sadly, in the church, we don't differ well. Sadly, in the American church, we don't disagree well. It's sad. But a church that is healthy is a church that leaves room for differences on these matters that are non-essential, where everybody doesn't have to be like you and everybody doesn't have to be like me. You know what this is a symptom of? You know the problem uh, related to this, what this is a symptom of? It's a symptom of a church forgetting its mission. It's where the petty is elevated to the prominent. It's where the insignificant becomes most important. And that which is non-essential becomes essential. And there are churches that push those things to the top and say everybody must believe the same way about every one of these things, about all these cultural things, about what to do in life, those kinds of things. And in one sense, the American church just has it too good because we we fight about things that just don't matter. And all you have to do is go to a place like Thailand as we did, and you you see a whole different response about people who are coming together for reasons that really, really matter. Because when people have no common struggle, no common fight, they're not fighting for something, they fight with each other. And we need to always remember what is the major thing, and that is our mission, our mission as a church. Let me tell you a story as we conclude tonight. It's a story that Max Lucado tells in one of his books from a few years ago. He's a Christian author, a writer. He talks about in his book how his father took him and one of his friends when they were like 10, 12 years old, something like that, on a fishing trip. And so they all get in the camper and they drive into the mountains on a Friday afternoon. And they finally arrive at the campsite and it starts sprinkling. It starts raining a little bit. And so they said, well, well, we'll not fish tonight. We'll just wait till tomorrow morning. We'll fish tomorrow morning. And so they stay that whole night in that little camper. And they start to get on their nerves a little bit. You know how if you're in enclosed places and, you know, patience can kind of grow dim. And it starts a little bit that night. Well, they're, they're looking forward to going fishing the next morning. And they get up the next morning and they look out. And now it's sleeting. A cold front had moved through. <laughs> And now the sleet is coming down. They keep going, and they start playing board games and trying to play cards and all this. But he talks about in the book, he tells very vivid examples of how they really started getting frustrated with each other and losing their patience with each other. And then they go along, they're keeping faith that it's, the weather's going to clear. They're going to wait and wait. They wait till that afternoon, it starts snowing, and it's really cold outside. Finally, toward the end of the afternoon, they just pack up the camper and they, they leave after getting in arguments with each other and losing their patience with each other. And this is what he says about them. He said, I realize this, that when people don't fish, they fight. (laughs) That's it. (laughs) Folks, we are called to be fishers of men. That's the mission that God has called us to. That's what's most important. We all submit ourselves. No one is above that mission. And if we will keep that front and center, we'll major on the majors, then we'll find that there's a core and a purpose by which we can rally around that will help us to get over our petty differences that we have with one another because there's something more important than the individual's. There's something more important than me, myself, and I, and me being right. What's more important is us. So people like us 
don't judge one another. Okay? Here in this place, we don't judge one another. We're going to leave room for differences. And we're going to focus on love and focus on the mission that Christ has for us. Let's bow in prayer. And I wonder right now, with your head bowed and your eyes closed, if you could just have a moment to reflect and respond. I don't know, you could have walked into the room kind of right in the middle of that, that cycle, that poisonous cycle of judgmentalism, that negative spirit, critical spirit. And maybe the Lord has just spoken to you tonight. You're so concerned about what others are doing or not doing. You're looking at the speck in another's eye and you're forgetting about the log in your own. You're forgetting about that you're a sinner saved by grace and that um, that you're someone that's not perfect and not leaving room for others to, to grow and to learn and not leaving room for others to interpret the Bible in these non-essential matters as they would. And it just kills the church. It just kills relationships. And so maybe right now in your heart, you could just confess that and pray. As I've prayed this week, God, help me to focus on me. I'm going to quit worrying about what others are doing or not doing. And do what I should do. Not any more or not any less. And be free from the negativity of looking at others. But instead, give my life to you as an act of worship for an audience of one. Being free from the critical spirit that so often uh, accompanies us. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the clear instruction of the Apostle Paul. I pray that we could apply it so practical. Uh, We could just um, come to understand what it means to act in maturity and unity and And know that the devil's scheme is to get us to focus on things that do not matter. And help us to focus on what truly is most important. And we trust you for this, God. Help us, God, to be people like this. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.